welcome to Japan, the world's best food destination and the country I like to call my second home. Food here is part art, part culture, and it's a national obsession. Over the coming weeks, I'm going to take you on a journey of discovery through Japan. This is where food for me starts to get very exciting. From the frozen north of Hokkaido. Come on, come on. To the tropical south of Okinawa and everything in between. Get too close to those big claws, I reckon you might take a finger off. You'll meet her food heroes. The fisher folk, the farmers, the artisans. Brilliant chefs and all of Japan's colourful characters who make this country's cuisine so exquisite. This is about as exciting to me as food gets. In my 20s, I lived in Japan for seven years. <laughs> it was during this time I learned to love the culture and this place has become my second home. <laughs> so please, sit back, relax, and spend some quality time with my family and me. You'll experience Japan like you've never seen it before. My adventure begins in Hokkaido. Known by Westerners as a skiing and snowboarding paradise, but considered by the Japanese as their country's top gourmet destination. Travelling around Hokkaido, there's little surprises everywhere. And I've been told that inside this pretty nondescript looking building, there's some of the best seafood in the entire world. The Kashiro markets are like a giant show bag of Hokkaido's incredible seafood. And I'd suggest to every food lover out there, you have to put Hokkaido on your bucket list. Right here is the place to start, and it begins with a bowl of rice. Doesn't look so impressive now, but just give me a second. You take your bowl around the market, and buy sashimi, one piece at a time. There's all these different kinds of, kinds of shrimps and kinds of prawns that I actually haven't even seen before. And you get to stand here and get to try them all. It's certainly one of the most varied bowls of seafood I've ever had. It looks delicious. I love it some of the world's best sashimi in a plastic bowl for under 10 bucks. On the road again, and I'm heading north to the remote village of Nemuro to meet up with Koji Shima, who runs a local seafood business. Yeah, these guys are, are farming or, or catching sea urchin, and it's all done by hand. There's no machinery that can do it. And that they, they're using a giant kind of lens almost and looking down into the water and using a, a probe to pick up the sea urchin, scoop it up and then tossing it back into the boat. When it's, when it's wavy, yeah. and the, the boats can fall over, so it's quite a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> it's freezing out here. And just think when you're having your piece of sea urchin at a sushi restaurant or in some pasta or something. This is where it might have come from. A guy out in a boat pulling it out of the ocean with his bare hands. But that's not the end of it. Back on land and Nemro's women get the other end of the bargain. Sure, it's not so dangerous, but 12 hours a day prepping sea urchins. Now that's a tough life.
<laughs> She's the funniest, but she doesn't want to talk to us today. Mmm, pasta was so good. All around Japan, sea urchin and pasta is probably one of the most popular ways of eating it, but all of these ladies here, they've never even tried it. It's quite baffling to me, really. You think you live in Tokyo, and you, you kind of know how Japanese people eat, but then you travel a little bit further afield and everything changes. It's beautiful, it's briny, it's creamy, incredibly creamy. Not really fishy, you know, some people don't like sea urchin because it's quite fishy, but when you get it straight out of the animal like this, it's beautiful. The winds turn and ice drifts have closed the harbour. But the work continues as Koji sorts the day's catch of Hokkaido's king crabs. <laughs> Look at this guy. Hi, dozo. They're pretty powerful too, and I don't want to get too close to those big claws. I reckon he might take a finger off. But they're just gorgeous, and they, they eat so well. I don't think I'm going to find a pot big enough to cook this sucker, so I might have to ask Shimasan to boil it up for me. The locals prefer to eat their king crab simply boiled in salt water. And when it's this fresh, that's hard to beat. But I'm gonna give it a good go. Shimasan's cooked up this beautiful king crab, and in Nemura, they like to eat it just as it is. But in the rest of Japan, often they eat crab with what's called sambaizu. To make it, it couldn't be easier. The name sambaizu, it comes from the three ingredients that go in there and the the three scoops that go in there too. Three scoops of rice vinegar. Two spoons of sugar. And of course it doesn't matter what size scoops you use because you're always using the same one. And finally, just one spoon of soy sauce. Just stir that around till it's dissolved. That's as simple as it can be. That's a perfect dipping sauce for our crab. Next up, Shima-san's brought in these wonderful scallops and it's not hard to see why Hokkaido's known for its scallops. In Australia, we might just eat the roe and mussel, but in Japan, all these bits around the side are fair game as well, except for this little black bitter gut there, so I need to cut that out. Those go onto our hot coals. Pat of butter on each one. And just a little drizzle of soy sauce. Of course, our last dish, our uni pasta, sea urchin pasta. Got some water on the boil here. With sea urchin as fresh as this, it's almost a crime to cook it. But I am going to cook some of it just to get that flavour through our pasta sauce, but most of it's going on just raw. Some butter into a hot fry pan. Into that, just a little garlic. We don't want to brown the garlic, so before that butter starts to change colour, I'll add in just a little of the local sake here. some Hokkaido cream and into that just a little bit of this sea urchin. Sorry little guys. It smells fantastic already. And drop our cooked pasta into this sea urchin sauce. It's a good idea just to add a few scoops of the, the pasta water as well because that helps to thicken the sauce and also season. Season it with just a, a little salt. Just placing more of these little tongues of urchin onto the pasta to heat through. To finish it off, just another Japanese flourish. Nori seaweed. So I can pull our scallops off here. 
that have been bubbling away nicely. So that's it, the taste of Hokkaido. King crab with sambaizu, uni pasta, and scallops with Hokkaido butter. Hokkaido's capital, Sapporo, is a small city with a big reputation. Michelin judges came here in 2012 and left behind Michelin stars for 69 establishments. It's one of Japan's favourite tourist destinations because, let's face it, Japan is a nation of 120 million obsessed food lovers. With an absolute galaxy of Michelin stars in Hokkaido, I could have chosen to go anywhere. But I've come here to a little restaurant run by a couple who have an absolute focus on communication with their diners and the art of hospitality. Their dedication to their art, I think, is at the heart of what makes food wonderful in this country. And it's earned them two Michelin stars. The first thing to note is they've opened Kapo Okada on a night off, just so we can film. An incredibly two-star chef, Yasunori Okada, has devised a recipe especially for me. The dish is called hairy crab and sea urchin nori roll with orange unkake. Chef Yasunori starts by gently steaming the sea urchin roll, then allowing it to cool. He removes the flesh from one hairy crab. A shishito pepper is stuffed with shiitake mushroom. Then burdock root or gobo root is prepared by shaving and soaking in water for 10 minutes. Now for the sauce. Yasunori segments a sweet, ripe orange and adds it to dashi stock with sake and ishiru. Then he brings it to the boil before adding a thickening agent, kuzu. Yasunori uses a low gluten plain flour to make a tempura batter. Then, placing the nori seaweed rough side down, he rolls the crab meat and urchin roe into a cylinder. The burdock root is squeezed, mixed with the batter and fried. Then the crab and sea urchin roll is battered and fried, and finally, the stuffed pepper. And when it comes together, it's a beautiful looking dish. is extraordinary. You can really feel the you can feel the the care and the thought that's gone into this dish. Okada san's taken oranges from South Australia where I'm from and a special kind of squid sauce from where my wife is from. And he's combined that with the famous hairy crab from Hokkaido and also that sea urchin roe. I feel that there's a real connection there between the chef and the diner and that's really what hospitality is. <laughs> As well as the seafood, Hokkaido is also famous for its dairy. And up here there's a cheesecake that's making quite a name for itself around Japan and around Southeast Asia as well. It's run by a couple who are absolutely fascinating and they're very shrewd business people, but they're not the type of Japanese business people that you and I might expect. Meet Yasuhiko Kaino. He owns and operates Farm Designs, a dairy farm cafe and home of the Choco Mood Cheesecake. So this is it, the famous cheesecake. But first, Kaino-san, why the cow soup? What do you mean? I want to welcome the customers. I want to do this kind of cosplay. Looking around the cafe Yasuhiko and his wife Meg built themselves, you get a great sense of fun. And I'm starting to see why this little place in the wilderness has become a success. But of course, the real proof is in the eating. Time to try this cheesecake. Wish you. <laughs> it's a fantastic cheesecake. There's a great story here. 
and it goes back to a time when Yasuhiko was just a boy, growing up in the city and watching his favourite TV show, Little House on the Prairie. He fell in love with the idea of farming. So after studying veterinary science, he went to Canada to learn how to build log cabins. Eventually he bought this old dairy farm, built the cafe, and together with his childhood sweetheart, started producing exceptional cheesecakes that are now selling all over Asia. The secret to their success, they say, is all in the milk. Earlier, Kaina-san told me that years ago when he first moved up here, when his first cows stopped milking, rather than having them sent away, he let them die of old age and he built memorials to them out in the woods. And he's the only one that knows where they are. Farm design no hanashi wa success story desu ka? Sore te mo love story desu ka? Kisa na success story to ouki na love story desu. Yasuhiko always had a vision, but it was Meg who came up with the cheesecake. And the cheesecake has turned farm designs into a multi-million dollar enterprise and one that still runs on the milk collected from just 45 cows. Now we're in the kitchen to find out the secret behind this wonderful Ushisan cheesecake or the, the Chokomu cheesecake. And of course, the driving force behind it all, Mrs. Kaino. The first step is their secret ingredient homemade milk jam. Simply mix full cream milk with sugar, then reduce. Then Meg makes a ganache with fresh cream and milk chocolate. <laughs> a base is made from a mix of crushed black cocoa biscuits with a little melted butter. <laughs> I didn't do a very good job with that. <laughs> Quite the perfection, it's gonna be absolutely perfect. Meg makes the filling by kneading cream cheese, then gradually adding sugar. She then adds sour cream, three eggs, and corn flour to bind. Whisk well and add vanilla extract. And finally, pouring cream is mixed with that milk jam we made earlier. Naturally, as you add that in there, you can really see it change the texture, it becomes silky. You can see it coming out the bottom. It's like paint, it's so smooth. That gets poured onto the base. Meg sinks blocks of chocolate ganache into the mix. And now the secret to that fantastic cow pattern. Meg adds some of the filling to the ganache mixture. It really does look sensational. It's so simple in a way but a really spectacular effect. So after an hour in the oven and a day in the fridge, we have our Chocomu cheesecake. Each one's unique and each one's made with love. Kawaii desu ne? One of the things I really wanted to do here in Hokkaido is to try the native Ainu cuisine. The Ainu are the indigenous people of this island and they're similar in ways to the Native Americans. I just love to see how they eat. Lake Akan remains as one of the only regions in Hokkaido where Ainu culture is proudly displayed and practiced. The Ainu have lived in Hokkaido for thousands of years and theirs is a culture that has evolved in harmony with this land's unique environment. Certainly doesn't look like any normal potato I've seen before. 
I'm tasting the Ainu classic pochaimo, a type of fermented potato cake. Mm. Fermented potato flour is mixed with water and shaped into a patty. The patty is simply pan fried in oil and served with butter. Wow, that's really quite unique. It's very fragrant and, and smells quite nutty, like a roasted pine nut or something like that. Probably more like a yam than a potato. It's very pleasant though and really nice for this kind of cold weather. If you're thinking of travelling to Japan, it's far more affordable than it used to be. Long gone are the bad old days of the economic bubble, and in fact tourism is the new boom industry. But like everything in Japan, they do it in their own special way. We're here on top of about 70 centimetres worth of ice, and I'm not much of a fisherman myself, so Hakata-san's here to teach me how to catch these little wakasagi, or the native Japanese pond smelts that we can hopefully make up into some lunch. Oh, we're getting some nibbles. I don't know if you can hear some of the commotion going on around us, but there's quite a lot of these holes drilled into the ice here and a lot of tents around. And every time you hear a scream like that, I think someone's caught a fish. So Hakata-san, I heard that your, your father used to eat these wakasagi raw and sometimes still alive. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done that? No, <laughs> too smelly for me. Yeah, I think fish on it. Uh, you reckon there's a yeah. fish there? Yeah. Small one, small I think. Hey, there we go. See, two of them. One, two. Yeah. Two fish, two little wakasagi. Our first catch, Japanese pond smelt, wakasagi. Not the best smelling fish in the world, but they are certainly delicious. Now I just need about 15 more of these for lunch. Come on, come on. Yay, two more. We caught a few of the wakasagi, the Japanese pond smelt, so this dish is Japanese pond smelts in Nambanzu style. These fish are quite fishy. I haven't done anything to them, haven't deboned them, taken the guts out or anything like that. Just washed them in some fresh water, taken off a bit of that fishy smell. But because we're here in Hokkaido, another trick to really get rid of it is a little milk. And I'll let those sit in the milk for about 30 minutes and that'll just get rid of some of that extra fishiness. While the smelts soak, I'll cook up a Japanese stock. It's simple, but incredibly important. Kombu, or sea kelp, is heated in water. Then dried bonito flakes are added. And in future episodes, I'll go into a lot more detail, but believe me, a well-made dashi is the secret behind almost any great Japanese dish. While waiting for our dashi stock, we can prepare our vegetables. I'm cutting the carrot in fine strips, what we would call in English or French a julienne but in Japanese, sengiri. Our pond smelts are ready. They're all different sizes, but that's what you get when you catch your own fish. While we're waiting for our oil to come up, we'll make our nambanzu. Namban actually translates to Southern Barbarian. And this is a technique that's come from the Portuguese that came into Japan down in Nagasaki. But the real secret behind nambanzu these chilies, and they're grown right here in Hokkaido. This dish is actually very similar to a Spanish escabeche, you know, something you might make with sardines, so they're a great substitute for these little wakasagi here. For the nanbanzu, we mix dashi stock, rice vinegar, soy sauce, and mirin for sweetness. So next, I'm just gonna give these little pond smelts, a dusting of flour. We need our oil at about 170 degrees, so a good way to test them, and a Japanese secret from using these wooden chopsticks, is to put them into the oil, and if small bubbles come off pretty much as soon as you drop them in there, you're at about 170, 180 degrees.
our smelter cooks. So we're doing something that's fairly unique to Japanese cuisine. We're taking them out of hot oil and they're going straight into our numbun vinegar. As they cool down, they'll soak up all of that delicious flavour. And over the top of those fish, we scatter our vegetables. Let that stand for about an hour and that dish will be done. Then finish it off with a little spring onion for colour. That's our dish. Japanese pond smelts, nambanzuke. Well, that's Hokkaido in a half hour. It really is one of the world's great flavour destinations. And it doesn't much matter what time of year you visit, because as you'll see on our journey, Japanese cuisine is all about seasonality and regionality. Next time, I pop across to the northern tip of Japan's largest island, Honshu, where the tuna can sell for a million bucks a fish. Freezing cold, I can't feel my fingers. Noodle eating is seen as a sport. My hundredth bowl. And nudity in the snow is definitely required. Feels like the most natural thing in the world.